Hey guys, as promised, I'm back again for my second video regarding the second session from MSPKCon's core sessions. Um, so just to recap, for those who aren't aware or don't know what's going on, MSPKCon 2023 just finished uh, in May of 2021, 20, 22, 21, 22, 23, whatever. Those are the dates of the, of the conference. It just happened last week. And... Um, we had the sessions broken out into two different formats. We've had the whole conference is broken into two different formats. We had some pre days in the beginning uh, during the day where everyone comes in and, and arrives. We had a few vendors hosting some uh, pre conference sessions that were really well received, which is really great. The second thing that we did was for the two days of the conference, the conference itself was two days, it was Monday, Tuesday. The two days of the conference, we split up the session types into two different formats. One style was where we had everyone in the main stage room. Um, everyone was sitting in front of the stage in, in the in grand ballroom B, it was, and they were listening to what we call the core sessions that were happening. There was the keynote that occurred. It was, it was pre the sessions. And then we've had three sessions that happened on day one. And then we had lunch. After lunch, we had breakout sessions. Breakout sessions were handled in separate rooms uh, where you basically pick your track or pick the session you want to go to and then go listen to and watch that session. And hopefully you learned something from both the core sessions and the breakout sessions. And then we did the same exact thing with day two. Difference was day two, we didn't have a keynote. And so the timing was a little bit different. The breakout sessions were an hour instead of 45 minutes and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the summary of what MSP Econ was. And so what I've been doing in this playlist on YouTube is I've been going through and summarizing the sessions uh, from each speaker, we had Kelvin Teflar, who spoke about the beginner's mindset and how it can impact your ego and how it can remove your ego so that you don't get caught up ignoring solutions that are actually really good and could potentially save you a lot of time and money and also build a better culture. Um, and so the last video I just did expanded on the beginner's mindset, provided an additional perspective um, and how it helps in, in general, like one of the things we kept pushing about MSP Econ is that these are not technical lessons. The core sessions are more life lessons than technical lessons. And these things that we're talking about can apply in so many different areas. And so my goal <laughs> for these videos, that was a really long winded introduction. My goal for these videos is to provide an additional perspective and additional aspects to those concepts to see if we can try pushing you a little bit more. And I'm going to keep trying to do this. I'm going to try to cover as many sessions as I can um, and get them out as quickly as I can instead of on a, on a specific cadence. I just I want to get it through, get it over with because it's on my mind, it just happened. And it was a huge success. And it's like literally burning in my mind. So that's what I'm trying to do. So in this video, uh, last week we talked about beginner's mindset. We talked about how it can be used for problem solving, how it can uh, help with confirmation bias. It can help with... Um, preconceived notions. And now we're talking about critical thinking. Kyle Hanslevin did an amazing session where he talked about his childhood story um, or teenager story, <laughs> I don't know, childhood, where he had a computer and the keyboard was taken away and he had a different keyboard uh, that had the wrong connector type. And he had to basically figure out uh, how to build a connector, an adapter from an AT connector, AT keyboard to a mini than six pin. Um, and it was a very interesting story. And he talked about how he used problem solving and, and you know, essentially guess and check uh, to solve the problem. And then how he can apply that same exact problem today using tools from today, uh, such as chat GPT and artificial intelligence in order to help you uh, augment your critical thinking abilities. Um, I want to provide additional perspective on that topic. I want to, I want to throw additional layer of thinking um, because we all know that AI is not really where it needs to be today. Like that's something that, that everyone can admit. It's, it's very impressive and it's very cool and GTP, GPT-4 and so on and so forth um, can do things that, um, that uh, are like almost mind blowing. You know, like you're having it pass the bar, you're having it do medical exams and so on and so forth. And it's really, really cool. But when you actually start using it to do stuff like it, doesn't provide exact answers. It's not always right. And you have to basically figure your way out on making sure you get the right responses. And I want to focus on those words, figure your way 
through or figure way, figure it out or work on it until the way you're doing this is because you ask a question, chat GPT gives you an answer, you try it out and the answer comes back as either right or wrong. Maybe it comes back half right. And you take that response that comes back and you test it out and you get back the results and you go back to chat GPT and say, hey, this is what happened. And then chat GPT goes, oh, well, okay, this is why that would have happened. And it gives you additional things to try and then you try it again. And then you, you keep iterating over the same exact process where you test and try and re report on the results until you get something that works or until you give up one of those two things. Um, so if we think about it for a moment, like my, my history, you know, as a technician, I said this in the last video too, I'm a problem solver. I'm a tier three engineer, uh, have been for the last 13 years of my life. I, I solve problems, whether it's technical or business. Um, and so the way that works and, and, and something people always ask me, like, how do you learn what to do? Or how do you, how do you know how to do this? Or how do you figure that out? And the process itself that I'm following is the exact same process. And in fact, it's known as the scientific process. Um, the scientific method specifically is where you have an environment, you collect data, you gather evidence, you perform a, you create a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis. And then as you're testing it, you collect more data and you repeat over and over and over again until your hypothesis is proven to be true, in which case it becomes a theory. And that is the scientific method. Um, the troubleshooting steps that we deal with whenever we're dealing with a problem are exactly the same thing. And the critical thinking process that we perform is literally the exact same thing. The questions we need to do, the questions we have to ask, right? Let's say chat GPT wasn't in the picture. Let's say we didn't have AI today and we just have to solve problems. Who would we go to to ask the question that we would normally ask chat GPT? And the answer is that I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you, is the answer is yourself. There are, there's a mindset that people adopt um, and it's not, it's, it's subconscious. It's not even something that you realize, right? Every single person has to deal with a problem solving in some way, shape or form. It's a fact of life. Everything that you do has some sort of problem will occur and you, you are able to solve it. And the way you solve it is different based off of what it is and how it is, but the format, the framework is always the same. You're trying something, it doesn't work. You go, that's weird, or that's not right, or that shouldn't happen that way. Let's try something else. And you try it again, iteratively changing things based off the feedback you receive from the trying that you're doing until you see something that works, right? So in a very simple method, you have a bunch of keys on a key ring, you're going to your door, you don't know which key it is. What do you do? I give up. I don't know which key it is. Let me go find someone who knows. <laughs> you have 10 keys on your key ring and you try each one until it works. That's the correct answer, right? In my last video, I talked about the different technical tiers and I said how a tier one technician is defined based off someone who will fix something based off what they know. A tier two technician is someone who will figure it out to solve the problem at hand. And a tier three technician is someone who will figure it out and provide a holistic solution for the entire problem moving forward forever, big picture. And so if I were to apply the problem of not being able to unlock my door, not knowing which key it is to my key ring to the tiers, a tier one technician will have the keys and know which key goes to that lock. And if they don't know, they will go ask someone else. And a tier two technician will have the keys, look at the lock and go, hmm, well, I see that the lock is a certain size. So I'm going to disregard all the small keys on the ring. Now I have three keys left. Now I'm going to try each one of these keys and guess which one is right and try each one until I get, I get in. And that's a tier two technician. They're solving for the problem right now. The tier three technician will look and say, well, I'm looking big picture, my home, I'm gonna convert the whole thing to a smart home. As I walk up to the door, the door is gonna self unlock because my phone and FC chip and or something like that, some crazy thing. I really don't have a good example of tier three on a keyring uh, scale because the scale is so small. But the idea is that he's thinking big picture, he's thinking holistic view. And so the process that you go through to solve those kinds of problems is exactly the same thing that you do on a computer or on a tech, uh, on a electrical thing or whatever it is that you're working on, a business problem that you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's gonna happen. You try it, you test it, you record results, you change it if it doesn't work the way you want, and you keep trying again and again and again and again until you have it working the way you need it to. And so 
the thing that I wanted to highlight, the additional perspective specifically, is that's the literally the exact same thing that you're doing with ChatGPT when you're communicating with ChatGPT. Yes, you can use it to augment your critical thinking because the amount of research you have to perform to come up with your hypothesis is, is significant. I don't know about you, but when I'm doing, as I said, a tier three technician, I'm solving problems and I'm looking for an error message. How many of you look Google a message or Google an error or start looking up a uh, potential behavior and then stop at the first link that you come up with that seems to match your problem? I open at least five or six different tabs of the same thing. And I'm looking for tabs, I'm looking for incidents that are reported about the problem, about the error message that are unrelated, that are not the same person, different um, environments, same exact symptoms, and same error message. I'm looking for things that can relate to narrow down because the way it works with computers, because everything, and especially in life in general, there are so many different scenarios that can come out to, to look the same. Therefore, it's impossible to look at the fir very first option and go, aha, that's the problem. You can't do that because it, there are so many ways that different scenarios can fall out to be the exact same symptom, even though it's a different root cause. And so what you have to do is you have to create like a cross-examination or, um, um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're, when you're cross comparing books and stuff like that, I forgot the word, um, but you have to basically build a, a matrix of different problems that are resulting the same way. And you can then narrow out, okay, what are the things that are different? Throw them out, right? What are the things that are the same? The error message. How is that error message coming up, coming across the same way on these three different things? And you're more likely to get to the root cause of a problem. One of the easiest tricks for this, um, you know, if there's one thing I want you guys to take away from this video, one thing I want you guys to take away from the conference is that uh, the easiest or best way to solve a problem is not to ask why something is not working. Instead, it's to ask why something is working. Um, and I'll give you a quick example. Um, let's say you have a, a program on your computer, or let's say your a client comes to you if you're a technician and says, hey, my program on my computer is no longer working, right? So what happens is that most people, if they don't, if they're not familiar with the program, they don't know what's going on. They're like, okay, well, is it supposed to work? Show me, show me somewhere it is working. And they compare a working system to a non-working system to try to figure out what's going on, okay? What are they doing in the back end there? Like behind the, in the back of their minds, what is the actual process that's going on? And Here's the key piece that will make it so much easier for everyone if you follow it. Instead of asking why is the program not working, instead of asking why is the program not opening, right? You're starting that mindset off in a negative mindset. You're starting it off saying, hey, why isn't this thing working? So you have the negative connotation of it not working and you're looking for the reason why and you don't know. There's no way you can possibly know. And so your mind just gets stuck. Like, oh, it's not working. I don't know. It's broken. Or you're, the fact of the statement of it not working relates to it being broken and you not being able to fix it. It's what I call the end user mindset. Uh, people like IT guys specifically, they like to talk down on people and are condescending um, to end users. They use the end user term as derogatory almost. Um, I like just to say that the end user is actually a mindset. It's not a person. It's not a, a, a title or position. It's the mindset that you're in right now. And so by coming up with the idea of it's not working, it's broken. What you're saying in reality is that it's supposed to work. It's not working right now. I don't know why. And it's broken and needs, someone needs to fix it. And I don't know how. If you change that and just adopt a level of assumption that things are not supposed to work. If you really knew how the technology was built, like you understood the house of cards. Anyone ever like played cards? Played building houses with their cards, right? One, one little push, the whole thing falls down. If you understood, that is literally what technology is. You have so many different parts and pieces that everyone decided to follow a protocol. And by some magic, electrical circuits running across the board is able to perform data transmission and display things to you in a way that actually works semi-consistently, at least 90% of the time. It's mind-blowing. And so if you start asking the question or start adopting the assumption that it's not supposed to work. It's not, it's not weird that it's working. It's not weird that it's not working. It's actually weird that it is working, which means you start asking the question why instead of the question why not. And so when you have a problem that comes to you and says, hey, my program is not opening, you're not asking why is it not opening? You're asking, well, why should it open? 
And you're suddenly presented with a like a, an execution chain of why the program should open. Well, if I'm looking at this icon on my desktop, it's a shortcut. The shortcut points to a folder in program files. The folder has an exe file in program files. And that exe file should be running when I open the shortcut. Now I have this entire execution chain about why this program should open. Well, I double click on the shortcut and it doesn't work. And I go looking for this target of that shortcut because I want to know why it's supposed to open, why I assume it would work. And I see that the folder is missing or the exe is gone because the antivirus or EDR software quarantined it or some other ridiculous reason. Even if it is there, my next step after trying to open it from a shortcut, because I'm establishing a chain and asking why it's supposed to work, I'm double clicking the icon inside of that program files folder. Does it open from there? No? Okay, what's the error message? What's going on? Why would it open? Is there something that's supposed to be there that's not there? And then I look at a computer that does work and I compare it and say, why does it work here? You know. And then I build again, a new chain, a new execution chain, a success chain essentially on why it's supposed to work. And when I find the break, I suddenly know why it doesn't work. And now my mindset changes. Instead of looking for why it would work, now I understand the reason why it would work. Now I'm looking for what's missing on this computer. And suddenly now the fix I'm looking for is how to recreate or how to repair the piece, the chain that's broken on this machine. The mindset that you've adopted changed from it's broken because it's supposed to work to it's not supposed to work. Let me figure out why it would work. And then we can figure out why it doesn't. It's a little bit backwards. Anyways, this video went a little long. I said that last time too. It may be a theme. I might just keep saying that. Thank you for watching. Leave your comments below. I hope this was helpful. And uh, yeah, have a good night.